Hello and welcome to episode 226 of the 21st Century Work Life podcast. I'm your host, Pilar Orti, and this is going to be a slightly different episode to what we have been creating recently. So we've had, uh, and is still going, the wonderful series on connection and disconnection in remote teams. And I can say it's wonderful because Brie Kajiati from Shield Geo is in charge of that. So it's wonderful. Uh, and it's got loads of guests in it. And of course, we've also had our multi-guest episodes where I've picked a theme and had a few, two or three or sometimes four guests talking about that topic. And then, of course, we have the episodes with Maya and myself, which we are releasing once a month, which are all about what's going on and, and what's up, <laughs> what's going on and what's up with Virtual Not Distant. So today I thought I'd go back to a more, um, well, to, to something we have I haven't done in a while, which is one guest, talking to one guest. And uh, one of the reasons, actually, uh, that I'm doing this is that Ross Winter, our producer, is on holiday. How dare he? <laughs> and I didn't get ahead enough in order to give him this episode. Uh, so we gave him a whole bunch, but I, I had to take my time with this one. So it means it's an easier uh, fix. So the quality will be, and the quality will be a little bit different because we recorded on Zoom. For those of you who are curious, usually when I have a guest, I record on Skype, traditional Skype, with a plugin that I have. Many guests, they haven't touched Skype in years and I make them go in there. Uh, otherwise, we use Zoom and this is, was the case with Caitlin. The problem with Zoom is the quality is not as good as my plugin. So there we go. But that's okay. The conversation is a very good one. So, and, and also I just fancied talking to uh, to Caitlin. So Caitlin MacDonald, today's guest, is um, she's a digital anthropologist and she, uh, she uh, created a research paper. She wrote a research paper with some colleagues on reconfiguring the collaborative workspace. And I took part in that. Uh, I, I'm quoted. <laughs> felt very important. Uh, and I really wanted her to share with you some of those findings because as many of you in the space will know, there is not enough research about how the workspace is working now, how the work, uh, the workspace, how the world of work as it is now with all the technology being used for collaboration, communication, are two different things. We'll come into that in the interview. So I was very delighted that there is research, um, contemporary research around that. And also uh, talking about and talking with companies that are not tech companies. As we know, the tech companies are very visible in the space. So it's very easy to to know what they're doing, to find out how they're operating, but other companies not that much. So uh, no music today. I will uh, welcome new listeners. Hello, as I said, my name is Pilar Orti and the company behind this podcast is Virtual Not Distant, where we help managers and teams transition to an office optional approach. We have a website, virtualnotdistant.com, and we have lots of stuff there. So, um, so check it out. And this podcast, the 21st Century Work Life podcast, well, here we talk talk a lot about leading remote teams, online collaboration, and working in distributed organizations. So I'm going to just um, signpost you to some work uh, podcasts, to some episodes, previous episodes that will be a great complement to this one. So bear with me. Uh, we mentioned near the beginning of the talk with Caitlin, she mentions um, how difficult it is to be spontaneous in the online workplace. So as part of the visible teamwork uh, model, is it a model? It's a set of context, uh, concepts. Visible teamwork, of course, includes deliberate communication, visible work and planned spontaneity. So if you are looking at how to create an environment where spontaneous interactions and conversations can take place between team members, then check out episode 211 on planned spontaneity or go to our blog. And we have a couple of articles around that, which uh, Maya will put the link in the show notes, please, Maya. <laughs> she, uh, she has the great task of uh, listening to the episodes and writing the show notes for, for you listening to follow and for those who 
don't really wish to listen to the episode to have a sense of what we do. So that is episode 211, Planned Spontaneity, October 2019. Going back even further, uh, you might be interested, someone who took part in this research also, uh, they were they used to be called, they're still called the brainy birds. And so there's an episode around workplace design, and that's episode 159. That might be interesting for you. Um, Caitlin mentions uh, proxemics and, uh, you know, how the space uh, and our, rela- our distance between each other even uh, affects how our relationships, how we talk to each other, how we feel about each other. And so if you're interested in the physical space, episode 159. So I'm going to leave you now with the conversation with uh, Caitlin MacDonald from the Leading Edge Forum. And just to say the title of the paper that uh, she wrote with collaborators is called Reconfiguring the Collaborative Workspace, Making the Most of Time, Space and Attitude. Now, the full study uh, report is only available for Leading Edge Forum members. However, we will link to a summary, to the executive summary. So, um, yes, I'll leave you now with our conversation. Well, I'm delighted to have with me today Dr. Caitlin McDonald, who is a digital anthropologist for the Leading Edge Forum, to talk about some research she uh, she undertook some months ago. So, welcome, Caitlin. Thank you, Pilar. It's really delightful to be here today. Um, So I thought I'd start a little bit with uh, what the research was about and who the Leading Edge Forum is. The Leading Edge Forum is an advisory organization that works with senior leaders, um, typically um, chief executive officers and chief technology officers and the like, to help them really reconsider their decisions and their outcomes and uh, make those better. So we do a range of different things, including um, what we call advisory, which is basically workshops and uh, immersive events uh, like study tours. Uh, And we also do thought leading research like the research that you participated in, which was all about how to reconfigure the collaborative landscape. So the title of the paper, was it Reconfiguring the Collaborative Workspace? That's correct. Making the most of time, space and attitude was our subtitle. Excellent, which uh, which I will ask you about in a second, what what those three things were. It's really interesting. Why did you, or how was this research research instigated? Why did you look at at this in particular? So I came into the LEF um, about a year and a half ago now. And when I was thinking about what I wanted my first project to be, I knew that the LEF was interested in um, taking a more anthropological approach to the research that it was doing, the research agenda that we have. In essence, I was thinking about um, some very kind of live issues, both for myself personally, as an anthropologist is wont to do, but also globally, I was seeing um, some trends around um, the shifting landscape of work for the information worker, in particular, um, greater flexibility and more um, push towards working from home, et cetera, and flexible Mm -hmm. working hours, for example. And in the kind of true anthropological way, um, I said, okay, well, let's, let's do some kind of structured study around this rather than just having me speculate about what this is like. Yeah. So I took a very kind of um, uh, both material and digital culture approach to looking at it. So when I talk about the anthropological approach, what I really mean is um, studying the way that people in groups um, collectively feel about work towards, organize themselves, arrange their, their, their lives with respect to a particular thing. And I was very curious about how in particular different kinds of digital technologies like increasing and more ubiquitous and more reliable video conferencing software, for example, um, like increasing um, use of cloud storage and um, better collaborative versions of document sharing and um, version control software for information workers was shifting the way that businesses were able to work. Um, And also as a result of that, then what are some of the new challenges that are emerging in these working environments where um, people are perhaps potentially being given more flexibility, but maybe don't exactly know how to use that flexibility effectively? Um, And how do we deal with different changes in habits? How do we deal with um, the way that we actually interact with one another being different online as opposed to offline? So a good first example there perhaps is that um, if you work in an office there are many, many opportunities for um, spontaneous interaction with people. You see people in the elevator, you see people in the hallway, you run into somebody at the coffee point, and you know, there's that little micro conversation that's like, oh, I'm glad I ran into you. 
I was thinking about this project, let's get together on this. And you have these like little, little tiny sparks that then turn into big things. Whereas if everyone works from home, it's harder to have those spontaneous interactions. You have to set up a meeting and then it's very formal. And because the meeting defaults to half an hour or an hour, you then feel like you have to fill up that whole time with talking and it becomes very kind of stilted and formal and you don't have those kind of spontaneous interactions anymore. So I was looking at this and thinking, what are different ways that um, organizations could develop new practices, new habits, new rituals around their new ways that they need to connect with each other? Uh, And that was really where it started. Really nice, really nice. So it wasn't specifically just about technology, but it's about everything. And in in fact, and that mix that you're talking about, and very interesting, the point about flexibility, which I will pick up on that we always uh, think flexibility is a wonderful thing, but sometimes it takes more work than we thought to, Mm. to make a flexible schedule work. There are so many norms. So we actually looked at the field of proxemics, which is um, the concept of personal space actually comes from the idea of proxemics, which is um, from an anthropologist called Edward Hall, who pioneered that in the 1960s, where um, you have certain essentially distances and to some extent also um, the way that you are facing um, another person or group of people that tells you, is this a kind of um, large interaction of many people? You know, are you standing on a stage basically? Um, Is this a social interaction of a group of people is this essentially a one-to-one interaction or, you know, as you, you physically move closer to someone, the interaction becomes more intimate and that can either feel um, great if that's what you want, or it can feel quite threatening. Digitally, there's a new emerging field around digital proxemics. So how do we replicate some of these sent these cues that we give one another through physical space? Um, what are the kinds of tools that you have in a digital space to understand whether someone is, um, how someone wants to engage with you? How do we really replicate some of those, those cues or which cues do we need to develop if if we can't replicate them. Digital proxemics. I love that. I really want mm. at some point mm-hmm. to hear more about that because that's that's something that when we've been on tools like Sococo, which is a, a plan, the plan of an office, or Remo more uh, recently, which again is a is a space full of tables digitally, mm-hmm. it starts to recreate that because that is the one thing that we're really, really missing is the, the space around us, sharing the space around us and making that space part of communication. I really see that. Uh, uh, in in live 2D events, it's uh, yeah, it's really missing. I agree. I can recommend. Um, there's a book titled Digital Proxemics by uh, an author called John A. MacArthur, um, who's written extensively in this field. And I would say that there's other um, emergent um, authors, you know, writing about this as well. But that's probably the the closest at the moment. Great. So we'll put a link to the book, and also maybe if uh, listeners are interested, just Google digital proxemics. And like Caitlin says, lots of the I will be doing that right before mm-hmm. I derail yeah. everyone again. <laughs> so yes. um, we've uh, heard why you started the research, what drew you to it. So what happened? So who took part in the research? And just tell us a little bit about the methodology. We took a kind of um, combined approach to this. So. Um, you know, when you think about research that's done in the uh, the industry space, um, typically the way that um, organizations like the Leading Edge Forum go about doing research is through a series of expert interviews where um, you go out, you find the leaders in, in the area that you're working in, and you, you ask them a series of questions about um, what they think about things. And I think that's a really valuable method. Um, but also, when you're working in an anthropological way, you want to include some lived experiences So I said, yes, we will absolutely do that. And we had some really fascinating interviews ranging from people who, for example, you know, manage the the spaces for the parliamentary estates here in London, which of course have very particular challenges when you're thinking about digitization to people who are digital nomads and were um, at the moment that I was speaking to them doing a um, a cross USA motorcycle tour, for example, and the kinds of um, digital security issues that they faced um, and and had to be thinking about in terms of uh, cybersecurity, for example, for, for the work that they were doing super interesting interviews. But I also said, okay, well, I would really like to do some um, ethnographic work and really get into the day-to-day lived experience of people who are experiencing some of the changes that we just talked about. And in order to do that, you know, typically when you do ethnography, you kind of go to the community that you're working with and you physically spend time with them. Um, And I was like, well, this is really all about digital change. So what are some emergent methods in uh, digital ways of working that we could actually use to do the kind of ethnography that I want to do. So we ended up doing what you might consider a series of diary studies, meaning that people wrote down their experiences for us in response to a number of prompts that we gave them. Um, And the way that we conducted this was we had a, a mobile phone app 
And then we had a series of questions throughout a period of two weeks. So we would get respondents from primarily large global organizations, but we had a couple of smaller ones in there as well. Um, and they would recruit participants from their employee base to participate in this project. And throughout a period of two weeks, you know, every once in a while during the day, they would get a little ping on their phone and it would ask them something like, what's happening around you right now? Or, you know, show me, take a picture of the, the room that you're in, or um, tell me something about how many meetings you had this week, um, or a range of different questions that we asked. And that was how we collected the data. And my favorite responses were always the more open-ended questions. So we had a few things that were kind of um, specifically about what time did you start work today or how many digital tools did you use, et cetera, et cetera. But my favorite things were always just what's happening right now. Like, what is the experience that you're having right in this moment? Um, and those always generated absolutely the most interesting responses. Um, so to give you a bit of background on the companies themselves, for the actual studies, we had five companies in a range of industries. So we had a pharmaceutical company, we had an insurance company, uh, a large um, power company, uh, a manufacturing defense firm, uh, and we also had an advertising agency. So um, really different kind of mix of skills, mix of backgrounds, mix of ways of working in there. And what was really interesting to me was um, both, of course, the things that were unique about each of those businesses, but also how much of the work that they did was the same and how much of how many of the challenges that they faced were the same. And this is really important as well, because I know that you weren't looking exclusively at distributed work or remote companies, uh, but a lot of the information that is out there about how companies work using technology comes from tech companies. So mm -hmm. it's really nice. That's something I, I really appreciated from the studies that you looked at a range of organizations and how technology is helping them collaborate and, and as well as the, mm -hmm. their other spaces. So that was, uh, I think that was really welcome also. For me, the, one of the most interesting things to consider was that actually, in many cases, companies are becoming increasingly mobile, or even if they're not thinking of themselves as mm. being um, more friendly to remote working or distributed working, there are many factors that are essentially forcing them into doing that. So if you consider um, groups who have to work across multiple time zones, they often essentially have an imperative. Their work requires them to be flexible about when they work. And what that often means is they then want to be flexible about where they work so that they can work at a time that works for them um, and not be commuting at the, the, the kind of um, major commuting times, for example. And again, you know, you had some examples of where this was going really well and people felt very supported in being able to choose their work flexibly. And you had other examples where um, people just felt like they were being completely stretched out throughout the whole day and never getting any time off and never feeling like they could switch off. Um, and you also had examples of groups that didn't perhaps think of themselves as being particularly um, struggling with remote working issues. But in reality, they maybe had one team member or um, one or two people that they worked with in a different office. Um, and what they were finding is it was much harder to um, be inclusive of those people and really experience the benefits of their full participation in the work unless they really had thought carefully about how they could integrate everybody in the situation that they were working in. I want to ask you a bit about the time, space, and attitude. However, you touched on flexibility, so let's let's hop on to that because that is something, as you said, that that really struck me when I was reading it, and especially I think maybe especially it was in one of the case studies, that tension in the flexibility of schedules. That yes, we think it's great that we can choose. However, if everyone is choosing when they're working, what happens then? <laughs> Yeah. Oh, yeah. So um, uh, one good example is a group that, uh, well, there's there's a couple examples that we can draw on, but um, the first one that occurs to me is one group that was working across uh, several different sites and they were talking about how great it was that they could choose all their time. And then they would say something like, oh, but this week I actually did have to meet with my boss a little bit late. It was really interesting because um, there was another group that if you looked at the kind of actual metrics of what they were saying in terms of when they started work and how many meetings they had and et cetera, et cetera, um, there was a, se a separate group where um, they had almost exactly the same kind of quantitative characteristics. But when people were talking about their work, it was really different. So you had one group that was saying, hey, this is really great. This is allowing me a lot of flexibility. And apart from today, when it wasn't quite so like that, uh, and you had another group that was saying, oh my God, I can never get out of the office. Um, people keep putting all these meetings in my calendar and I'm working these like 85 hour days. And uh, so you had these really different attitudes towards what was virtually the same. You know, if you just looked at it from a metrics point of view, it was almost exactly the same conditions, but you wouldn't know that people felt so differently about that unless you actually ask them what was going on in their, in their experience, right? 
So first of all, I rarely think that metrics alone are enough to tell you what's really happening on the ground, because you might make some assumptions about what that information means and then find it means something totally different. But second of all, um, that there was that kind of sense of, um, okay, so even if it is the same and they are working roughly the same hours, et cetera, um, one of these groups is okay with that and the other one isn't. So like, why is that happening? <laughs> wow. um, so that was really interesting. And then the second group I wanted to draw attention to was um, one of the firms that we worked with. We often think of digital technologies as being like this great new um, collaborative way of working. And, you know, if you get something like Microsoft Teams or Slack, that's going to really uh, superpower the way that your group is able to work asynchronously because you're not kind of passing around these ping ponging giant long threads of emails anymore. And isn't that fantastic? Um, and in reality, for this particular group, which works on some extremely sensitive information related to defense, they actually weren't allowed to use most of that technology. So what they were doing is they were tr physically traveling back and forth to multiple sites. So basically, somebody in the group was always on the road to try and go and actually physically talk to somebody else because they felt like that was the only way that they could manage some of this sensitive information. And then the, the thing that ended up happening is uh, they realized that instead of one person traveling all the time, because they were basically kind of constantly on the road, they thought to themselves, okay, well, if we consolidate our travel and we all get together at once in one location, instead of just one person traveling to one of these three different sites that we all work across and everyone's constantly on the move, then what we can do is we can supercharge the time that we're together, get on the same page and be really synchronous and develop that kind of rhythmic sense of what we're working on and, you know, um, keeping in, in touch with each other and keeping in tune and keeping in time with one another. And then when we're apart, we can, you know, do all the stuff that you can do when you're away from people. And you can do that much faster when you all have some agreement on what you're doing. So there was something about that synchronicity that enables flexibility when you're not together, basically. I love that. That flexibility when you're not together is enabled by actually mm. the synchronicity of having to be with other people at the same time in the same space. Yeah, precisely. Um, that is so interesting. My mind is just going everywhere because you've got um, a, a group whose work doesn't allow for all the technology that a lot of us are taking mm. advantage of. They can't because of the nature of the work. So they've gone back and go, right, how how do we do this? They've tried something, they've, uh, they've, they've evaluated it and they've come up with something that works better. And then also a distinction that you make in the paper between communication and collaboration They've seen that collaboration gets done better when they are in the same physical space. And probably then when they're away from each other, maybe they just need to communicate. Maybe they don't mm. need to be collaborating. Can you just for listeners, because this is something that I think is really important and often missed out. Can mm. you just touch on the distinction between communication and collaboration? Because I have seen this um, when uh, evaluating collaboration, for example, um, asking people, who have you talked to today and how many people have you talked to today? And that being a measure of collaboration when that could just be communication. So what is the difference, Caitlin? Oh, it was so fascinating because I asked this question in almost every interview that I did. And at first everyone's like, oh, that's easy. And then they would stop and think about it for a second. And they were like, oh, no. <laughs> it turns out this is a really complicated question. Um, some people had really, you know, straightforward mental models of what it meant. And then other people realized that they didn't, they had never previously been called upon to think about the difference. Mm. Um, but in essence, what we boiled down to is that communication is simply the exchange of information, right? So um, I can tell you something, you can tell me something. And then I can kind of get on with my day without that, without further reference to what you said, basically. Whereas collaboration requires the other person to do something or, or I require something from them in order to achieve something that I couldn't have achieved without them. So, you know, information is fantastic, but the, the collaboration part requires both parties input to produce something that couldn't have happened without either of them or multiple parties if there's multiple involved. And I like that because sometimes I have come across groups of people who are calling themselves teams, but actually they're not. They're not collaborating. They are just connecting and, uh, and communicating and passing information through. And that requires a different set of work environment and workspace than a team that's actually collaborating. Um, yeah, so, yeah very important. I think it is possible to collaborate asynchronously. Oh, yes. Um, but I think you, you've rightly hit on the distinction that um, the, the actual output has to be altered by the, the, the members of the group. Um, and whether that happens synchronously or asynchronously, having some time that is synchronous, um, where everyone's getting together and, and getting on the same page about what's going to happen, um, is really critical for the output to then be really effective. 
So you can do it without that, but it will take a lot longer. And perhaps the results are a bit, I want to say the word mushier, essentially. <laughs> That's a good word, Caitlin. Mm. <laughs> Mushy. Yeah. Excellent. Good. So we've got that. So we've got the, the flexibility uh, issue and, 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 yeah, and the whole range of how different teams are experiencing it and, and how even individuals might be experiencing it differently. Let's go back to this concept of time, space, and attitude that you introduced mm. in the paper because the five case studies, there's a reference to these concepts. What are they? How did you come uh, up? Did you come up with them after you'd gone through all the research? Or is this something you already had in mind? Uh, it actually was not something that we already had in mind. It was definitely something that emerged as the research, as we were starting to analyze the case studies, as we were getting the data in. And what we essentially realized was, uh, so when we looked at the, the granular data that we were getting back, mostly what people were talking about when we were asking them things like, what kinds of tools are you using? Um, what's happening at the start of your work day? You know, how do you finish for the day? What's, what's it like for you right now? The kinds of answers that people were, were giving us were primarily in relation to something about their schedule or their time or use of time. Um, and that could range from things like people saying, the very first thing that I do when I wake up all the time is check my email or check the Wi-Fi so I can check my email. <laughs> and like that was a pretty common response, except for this one group who was in the pharmaceutical company who said that the first, most of them said that the first thing they, they did every day was check their schedule so that they could determine who they had to meet with and what kinds of dependencies other people in the group had. So they didn't immediately jump in. They first thought about, okay, so what, what do people need from me this week? And that really then determined how they set up the rest of their day or their week, which was a fascinating distinction. Um, so you had kind of this, this one pressure or, um, or in some cases, people were saying it wasn't a pressure, but that was pretty rare around time. And then you had people talking about their physical environment quite a bit. So particularly for people that were working in offices, they were either, mostly they were super annoyed because other people were working around them and they didn't have enough um, sound separation. So often when you're dealing with an open plan office, it can be great for the, facilitating those kinds of um, spontaneous interactions that we talked about before. But if you work in an open plan office and most of the people that you work with aren't in that open plan office, so if you have to do a lot of calls, for example, that can be super distracting, especially if you don't have good enough equipment to really support the isolation that you need, the, the kind of sound isolation that you need for that to work. Uh, and then you have people, for example, working from home who are um, perhaps managing some distractions in the home uh, or, or feeling so excited that they have the flexibility that they can um, you know, take off for a few minutes and it won't matter. You then had, so, so that kind of the, the, the physical environment side of it, the space. Um, but we also came to think about space as, as not only the physical environment, but also about the, the mental space, the headspace that you need to do different kinds of work, whether that be collaborative or focus time, you know, solo focus time or whatever it was. And then we kind of really started reconceptualizing when you think about space to include this kind of collaborative zone where um, if you can imagine your own mental working environment as being a, a little kind of private arena or a room. And then you have somebody else's mental room that they're kind of working with. And then you step into this zone where you're essentially trying to share your mental room with someone else and incorporate their room. And I think that's really what the collaborative zone is all about. It's, it's, the, it's a kind of mutual mental model working space, which if you're familiar with Nanaka and Cove's um, concept of BA, which essentially is this, this very concept around um, kind of a mutual sharing workspace, this is really what we were coming to when we were talking about space. But the wow. thing that really impacted everything was the attitude piece, because there was this third thing. Um, so I mentioned earlier that um, we had a few groups that um, if you looked at the kind of structural answers that they were giving us, they were virtually the same on the surface. But then when you dove into what they were saying about essentially how they felt about their work, the attitude was so different in those environments. And that was really fascinating, because essentially what we learned was people will adapt to their conditions very differently depending on the way that they interpret the meaning of their work. And that is really where the importance of attitude comes into play. Because often, you know, when you think about how work is set up, um, or, you know, just in general, laws of the universe, time is a thing that you can never, ever get back. Once you spend time on something, that's happened. It's never <laughs> coming back to you. And for most organizations, their physical space, unless they're moving offices or, or something like that, they might have a little bit of control over how the office is laid out, but for the most part, they have some limitations in terms of actually changing the space. But what they do have is potentially, the, although it's difficult, the ability to look at how people's attitudes about work 
are showing what they think the meaning of their work is, and then to shift that in the right direction so that those time and space things are um, seen as supports rather than hindrances in their day-to-day work. I really like that, the fact that they can be a support rather yeah. rather than mm-hmm. a hindrance. I'd never looked at it like that. We always think it's great, but actually, how can they really support it besides the fact that you can work at any time or that you can work from anywhere? But what is, what is that enabling us to do? Mm-hmm. Um, Mm -hmm. Wonderful. Uh, And and listeners, I hope you also enjoyed the using space, not just for our physical or digital surroundings, but actually what's going on in our minds, (laughs) in our heads. Mm -hmm. We forget Mm -hmm. sometimes that, that, yeah, you do go into different spaces on your mind. Yeah, Mm -hmm. very nice. Right. So there's one other uh, general thing that I picked up that I wanted to uh, I wanted to ask you to elaborate on and then we'll go into one of the case studies which was the, the one that I thought might be of most interest to the listeners but the the thing I wanted to pick up was the, the this thing <laughs> it's terrible vocabulary from my point mm-hmm. around digital presenteeism versus people wanting to hide away from overload so for a start if you can let us know what you found what did you find that around digital presenteeism what we really were talking about is, um, and, you know, there's definitely, you can look at this as being an analogous behavior that you see in physical working environments as well. So, you know, there's often the person who's the last one out, you see them when you come in, you know, they're always there. Um, And then we were realizing that um, what we were observing in certain kinds of behaviors that we were picking up in the data that we had was that people were replicating this in an online way. So you had people sending flurries of emails to prove that they've gotten online first thing in the morning. Mm-hmm. So, you know, uh, if, if you're in a, in a situation where you, you don't show up to work so the boss doesn't see you, how do they know that you're working? Oh, okay, I'll just send a whole bunch of messages CCing everyone in the team so they know <laughs> that I'm there. Or uh, somebody starts an email thread and every single person feels like they have to chime in, not, only, not because they have anything interesting to say necessarily, but because if they don't say something, then... They won't, the others won't know that they saw the email thread or the others won't know that they're listening, as it were. Mm-hmm. Or um, a third party who might be, for example, their manager will think that they're not paying attention. So there's this kind of, I have to be seen to be working situation, which is sometimes then leading to uh, over-communication. And then you get also people feeling like they couldn't decline, decline meeting invitations, for example. So we had one person saying that they uh, they literally never left their desk unless they were going to use the bathroom, which I was saddened by, yeah. um, but also I think is probably quite common. Mm-hmm. Um, there was one person who I in particular remember um, was deeply disappointed because they, they were like, I start at eight. So people keep putting them, you know, meetings in my calendar at four or five, not realizing that I then, well, no, they didn't say what they said was they think nothing of doing this meaning that I am end up working seven or eight hours, you know, sorry, uh, eight or nine hours longer than, uh, that r- longer than my usual working time, not hours longer, but you know what I mean? Yes, um, more hours. Yeah. Thank you. My sentence got muddled, <laughs> but the meaning was there. It's um, contagious, Caitlin. It's my, my, my <laughs> stuff. <laughs> so, so yeah, so essentially they were saying, I feel like I'm being forced to work longer hours because people keep putting these meetings in my diary. And my reaction to that when I saw that data was, okay, do the other people know that you're starting early? Have you ever actually told them, first of all? And secondly, have you ever declined a meeting request? Have you ever said, no, I'm not going to meet you at that hour because I have already worked my full day? And what's preventing you? If, if not, if the answer to those questions is no, what's stopping you? And of course, you know there are plenty of reasons why you might not want to do that. Is it with a huge major boss and you don't want to say no to them, et cetera? But also, if you work in a culture that really supports you know, not, not overworking, then you should feel free to say no. Um, or to suggest a different time, or to essentially say, hey, I've, I've done my piece here. Um, can we find an alternative time for this? Um, and interestingly, when we brought that data up to the company, to the managers in the company, um, th- their reaction to this was, we keep telling them to decline meeting invitations, and they keep refusing to do that, because what was happening is this group really wanted to, uh, to, to provide the best possible quality output to their constituents, their clients. And as a result of that, everyone felt really uncomfortable saying no to meeting requests because they felt like it would mean that people didn't think that they were engaged or involved. And then what we were essentially saying to the leadership of this company is, um, you have to encourage the employees to shift away from a mindset that says that being present is the same as being effective. Because what's happening right now is with the very best intentions in the world for them trying to do the best by the clients of your group, 
what they're really doing is actually very harmful because if you don't ever take a break, if you don't ever step away from your desk, you basically can't work as effectively as if you do take a break. So you need to instill a culture of less long meetings and more flexibility to you know, introduce effectiveness, essentially. And you have to essentially um, recognize the value of what they're trying to do, you know, recognize the, that the intention here is positive. Because if you just go around trying to punish this behavior, it's not going to work. But what you're trying to do is say, we're going to hold on to this positive intention, but shift it to a new set of behaviors that is actually going to have the result that we want. So that was really where we were coming from was you have to you have to recognize the positive intention under this really harmful and counterproductive behavior that's happening. It, it goes back also in my mind to that whole thing about time, space and attitude, uh, mm. how difficult it is to shift that attitude. And when you're giving people uh, that flexibility, also, there's all these things that are going to go in uh, through their heads. It's not just, oh, I've got my own schedule, but actually, yes. If if I'm there, I'm providing a better service. If I'm there, I'm being a better team member. If I'm there, I'm being seen as caring, as et cetera, et cetera. Mm-hmm. And it is so yeah. complex. <laughs> mm-hmm. Wonderful. And I think the presenteeism thing as well, it um, it comes back essentially to an anxiety about not being seen to be effective. Um, and then it, it also comes back to, I mentioned the group earlier that was traveling around all the time. Mm-hmm. Um, well, one of the things before they decided to do this thing where they were all going to get together in one place, previously, this group, which was an innovation group, had been asked to spend their Friday mornings, every Friday morning, essentially just do, doing experiments, doing different stuff, going out and looking at new digital tools, playing with new um, technology, um, trying out new, uh, new stuff that they'd never tried, looking for innovation. And essentially what was happening is they were refusing to do it because they all sat in offices with other people who didn't have the same remit. And uh, as a result of that, what they, what they turned around and told their own bosses was, if I do this, people are going to think that I'm larking about, that I'm not working. So instead of doing what they'd actually been asked to do to be productive, they were prioritizing looking like they were working, which meant you know doing email or PowerPoint or whatever it was, mm-hmm. over doing what they'd actually been asked to do, which I found so fascinating. Um, but also, it, it just proves that the social pressure of being somewhere where um, you know what the norm looks like, of what working looks like actually outweighed what they've been asked to do by their own bosses, right? So they were able to then get around that by saying, okay, when we all get together, that's, we'll do one long day of everybody doing the, um, the innovation stuff when we're all together. So it'll feel more social collaborative and um, you won't feel like the odd one out. So that was the thing that really got them over that kind of hump of how do I look like I'm working versus actually doing what I've been asked to do. Oh, it's huge. <laughs> it's really yeah. doing my head in <laughs> so many levels. Yeah. Wow. 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 Good. So we've got that to think about, listeners. Um, the 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 presenteeism versus the the overload uh, and everything in between. The not just the presenteeism, which the relation may need to a manager or team members, actually, maybe even to other people in the office. <laughs> mm-hmm. Who are um, there's there's just so much. There's also this whole thing about identity. I imagine. So if someone mm-hmm. likes to be seen as a hard worker, it's going to be very difficult to drop those habits uh, and those behaviors that help others to see them like that. So, mm. okay, listen, send us your uh, questions, virtualnotdistant.com. Use the contact from there if you have any reflections on this, because I'm sure many of you will have. Mm. So, um, so Caitlin, let's, let's move over to the, the case study, um, the case study on Uniper. Was it Uniper mm-hmm. SC? Is that right? Yes, that's right. Yes. Um, and the, the reason I picked this one is that as I read it, it, it seemed to me probably because of the international um, uh, makeup of the, of the group, although some of the other ones were also global. It, it, this, there's lots of stuff there that I thought, hmm, this is, yes, I've come across this and there's a lot that had to do with technology. So mm-hmm. do you want to give us an, just a little bit of overview of what the organization uh, was or, or the makeup of the people or some of the stuff that happened there? So uh, Uniper is a power company that operates um, across Europe and uh, in the UK. Um, and they're kind of two main offices. Um, they have one um, in Dusseldorf and they have one up in Birmingham in the UK. And they have some other sites as well across both, com- um, across both countries. And um, one of the things that was happening in Uniper was, I mean, there were several interesting characteristics of, of every case study, but in this one, <laughs> I think the things that really stood out were how much people talked about seeing and wanting to be seen. And in particular, for the German group especially, um, 
the canteen was this place where people ran into each other and they saw each other and they found out about what was going on in the rest of the organization. And, um, you know, if, if I hadn't gone down there today, I wouldn't have found out about this project. And, you know, some people just quite simply said, um, I, I always go to the canteen for breakfast and there I see lots of people. Um, and you had mm-hmm. one leader saying, um, uh, I, I can't have a, a, a desk in a closed office anymore. I sit out with the team because I can't lead from behind a closed door, for example. So it was really, really critical for this group that they they see each other and be seen. Um, but interestingly, one of the th- challenges that they were facing is um, because they had so many um, cross collaborations with the UK, um, what they were finding is that the, the 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 technology teams were really reluctant to take video calls in the open plan office because it was too distracting. But the really interesting part of this was they didn't think that it was too distracting for themselves. They thought it was too distracting for the people on the other end of the phone. Um, and similarly, they also mentioned um, that issue as well when they were taking group meetings where um, you had lots of people in a conference room and then maybe you had one or two people dialing in from a different place. They would say, okay, we don't have the right kind of speaker in this room, um, which means that the other people can't fully participate in this meeting. So they weren't just talking about it being annoying for themselves. They were talking about their consideration and concern for their colleagues not being able to fully fully participate in the work that they were trying to do together. Which is, uh, which is the opposite of what we usually think. Mm. <laughs> it's uh, very considerate yeah. of, uh, of, their, of their team members. Um, and there was uh, something you mentioned in that case study, um, the, the problems that bring your own device can bring. Is this what you were referring to? Mm. Yeah, so um, they had an interesting situation where... Um, the employees were constantly requesting like really fancy expensive headphones uh, to expense to the business um, because they had these uh, headphones that they've been given to, you know, to do their work. And um, the, the person who was our kind of primary point of contact there um, was like, oh, I really don't, and you can just imagine he's a slightly Northern British person. So he's like, I really don't want to pay for these expensive headphones. I don't understand what's going on. And then we, we showed him these pictures that probably five or 10 people had set in of like these slightly broken headphones with the foam falling off. And, um, and then we, said, we showed them what they said, which was not that it was annoying for them, but that they felt like other people couldn't hear them and that it was too distracting for other people on the call. So they, they couldn't collaborate effectively with these people they were trying to talk to. And he looked at that and he went, okay, I'll get them all new headphones. So, you know, <laughs> on the one hand, great. We had some direct organizational influence there. Um, we actually showed them, you know, it, 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 like you have to get out into the, the, the world of the person who is experiencing the problem to understand what's going on and why it is that they are asking these requests of you. So, but also mm-hmm. the, the bring your own device thing um, at Uniper, that was the other piece was that people were saying, I have to bring my own headphones because they're refusing to spend the money. But now, of course, we've solved that problem by going in and, um, you know, they, they will get some nice new headphones for everybody. But there's other organizations where it's a challenge as well. So, um, of course, you have lots of different kinds of security and privacy issues with people bringing their own phones or wanting to, um, you know, do work on their devices. And there were some interesting challenges that I heard around that and some solutions that I heard around that as well. So um, uh, one example would be um, the, the, the Food Standards Agency here in the UK said that um, they have policies, which essentially everyone gets the same kit, no matter what kind of working environment they work in. So um in the case of the Food Standards Agency, you have lots of people going out into the field to actually do on-site inspections of, you know, abattoirs and um, restaurants and, and places like that. Um, and of course, they have requirements around mobile devices that, you know, they just they just need to be able to use things in lots of different situations. But what they did was they said, okay, we won't just give the field workers those things. We're going to give the same standard set of tools across the whole um, across the board because that way everybody has a sense of solidarity about what they're using. And also there's some compatibility issues which make it much easier if everybody has the same stuff. So that kind of reduced the friction of, okay, why does so-and-so get a nice fancy iPhone and I don't? Not that I'm saying that they use iPhones, but um, you know, why does so-and-so get some <laughs> nice stuff and I, I have to be stuck with this old you know, machine, whatever it is. And that is a really good way of, um, regardless of the makeup of the organization, of leveling the field, Mm. because sometimes we think about remote workers are the ones that are being forgotten about, but actually sometimes the people in the office also need a good set of headphones. Mm. It's not just the the people who are are seen as being more remote. Mm. So... And, and and this is something that many organizations forget, like you're saying, that in order to have a truly mobile and flexible workforce, especially in the case of the um, FSA, they need to be 
truly <laughs> mobile. And you have to give them the equipment. And even something like if you are relying on meetings for your people to talk to each other, then you've got to give them really, it's the same as you would want them to have nice meeting mm. rooms. Mm -hmm. Well, give them nice headphones. Precisely. You have to think about, you know, what we what we talked about was having the right kit for the right job. You know, you, you have to you have to think about the kind of work that your employees are, are going through and consider what's going to make things not only effective for the individual, but also really make it effective for, for people to, in a group, um, achieve what they need to achieve together. Um, and, that, and that, of course, is going to vary depending on the work, the working environment that you're working in. But, you know, the first step, of course, just like with any user research, is to go out and talk to this, the, the group that you're working with and figure out what is it that they actually need. You mean ask them? <laughs> My God, <laughs> radical concept. I know, you know, or or observe them and say, okay, they they're saying that they need all this super fancy upper, you know, upper upper end kit, but actually they could probably get away with um, whatever over here. Yes, and sometimes we think we need really good headphones, and actually we might need a better broadband. Precisely. Um, yeah. So that's really interesting as well. When we start to get into the tech, also, ooh, yeah. uh, that's another another one. So, Caitlin, is there anything else that you would like to share, either about something that you found interesting in the research, or your own experience with it, or your own experience as a digital anthropologist? Anything else you'd like to share with our listeners? Yeah, I think possibly. Um a point that's coming out at like that's very topical at the moment. So we've seen a lot of um, companies around the world starting to implement um, travel policies or canceling events or um, encouraging employees to work from home because of the coronavirus, for example. Mm -hmm. So um, you're now getting into the situation where um, some companies are perhaps already good at supporting this, but other companies are, are going to be going on this journey for the first time um, and who have maybe never experienced working remotely before. Um, and this, of course, is both a good test, but also perhaps um, one of the scariest times to experience this is under duress um, yes. and when they haven't really perhaps thought about it in very much depth about how they're going to make this an easy transition for their employees. Um, so there's an opportunity for this to be super successful, but there's also some risks. And related to that point, I would say one thing that we didn't actually end up getting a huge amount into in the, re in the, the report that we wrote um, was... What, but one question that I was interested in exploring when I initially set out on this research was, um, you know, especially in urban environments, um, you have increasing situations where, you know, perhaps you're dealing with a, co a cohort of either younger employees or, or simply because of the pressures of the nature of the housing market in that area, you might have employees who are sharing space, um, particularly in London. If I think about the housing market here locally, you have plenty of people who are in their 30s, 40s and beyond who, you know, might be working, uh, you know, if you want them to work from home, they're working in a shared apartment building, um, a, a, a shared apartment or flat. Um, or, you know, of course, you have um, people who might be working from home and uh, managing challenges with sharing space with their families, etc. Um, and one of the things that I think organizations need to think about is, okay, so if you're Mr. Big Director in your wonderful home office, which has a beautiful setup on a desk uh, in some kind of library-like um, personal home office, then fantastic for you. But in reality, many of your employees may not be able to have working conditions in the home that are really sufficient for the needs that you're asking them to meet. What is it that your workplace is going to do to make it easier for people who are, are now perhaps working in either more cramped spaces or um, noisy environments or um, you know, I mentioned today when I joined this call that I was wearing gloves because my apartment is cold, which is a choice. Yes. Obviously, I can turn the heating on anytime I want to. But, you know, for some people, having a warm office to go to during the day um, is a real issue, right? So, um, so what is it that, how are employers going to adjust to um, asking employees essentially to be the ones setting up their own spaces? You know, what kinds of affordances are they, they going to allow? And one example of a company that is looking at this is... Um, Buffer, um, the social media tools company, um, who, when I spoke to them, was talking about um, the allowances that they give employees to work from coffee shops, for example, um, or to provide their, you know, to provide better furniture for the home or, or whatever it might be. They were a really interesting example because although they think of themselves as being a remote company, for one thing, to get back to our point about synchronicity earlier, they would say, you know, we, we always have a time that we get together as the whole group. Um, we would never call ourselves remote as in never get together, but remote most of the time. And then we have to have those times that we're together. 
And secondly, um, they've thought that carefully about how they're going to budget for their employees to make their working space the best possible environment for them. Um, so if you look at a model like that, where they actually have put some effort into that because they don't really, they don't have any offices, you know, they have like perhaps one small space that is um, their legal home entity, but you know, their, their entire model is, is having employees set up the right space for them, whether that's at home or in a co-working space or in a coffee shop or whatever it is. And as a result of knowing that they were going to do that, they actually made some budget, they put some budget in place for that. So I think that's something that really, um, I would have liked to explore in more depth, but it just didn't come up in a lot of the research that we were doing. And that is crucial, what you're saying there mm -hmm. about if we are expecting or we're um, enabling people to work from home. One, I think the question always has to be, do they want to work from home? Mm -hmm. Secondly, once they've tried it, do they still want to work from home? Yes. And thirdly, are we? is this an office optional or a, a, or a, a home obligatory setup, mm -hmm. which is going back to your point about the coronavirus. Many people have to work from home. That is not ideal for remote work because you want people to have the flexibility to choose from where they work best mm. and that forcing the same as we don't want to force people to go into the office we don't want to be forcing people to work from home so mm. I'm completely with for me it's such a mixed bag this yeah. uh, this thing that's happening that uh, I'm yeah it's going to be really interesting yeah Yes, we, we'll see what happens. Uh, well, yes, we'll see what, what good what experiments work and also what the attitude is at the mm. end of it. Mm. Um, so, Caitlin, the, if I understand correctly, the full report is only available for LEF members. Is that right or is that wrong? That's right. So it's available to our, our client members, but there is a um, executive summary which can be downloaded yes. from the website. Uh, and there's a, a small video of me talking about it and, and things of that nature. So, And Caitlin, if anyone has uh, any questions, I hope they won't bombard you, but, you know, or they want to connect with you, where is the best space to find you in? They can email me at caitlin.mcdonald at leadingedgeforum.com or they can find me on Twitter at cmcd underscore phd. Wonderful. Well, thank you very, very much for all that. And thank you very much on behalf of all of us, listeners included, uh, for, for carrying out this study. Oh, it was absolutely my pleasure, Pilar. And thank you for having me today. Listeners, thank you very much for listening to the 21st Century Work Life podcast brought to you by Virtual Not Distant. If you have any comments, if you want to send us a message, if you want to share your reflections, your thoughts, or even suggest a topic for another episode, then do get in touch. You can get in touch with me directly uh, by via email, pilar at virtualnotdistant.com. That's P-I-L-A-R. You can find me on Twitter, which I love, at Pilar or T, P-I-L-A-R-O. -T, P -I -L -A -R -O RTI. If you want to connect on LinkedIn, I'd be delighted to connect with you. But tell me, tell me that you listen to the podcast when you connect so that I know just to press accept. And thank you for listening there. And you can um, contact us through the website virtualnotdistant.com. We have a contact page. Or if you want to message us on Twitter, virtual team work with a zero instead of an O. That is the curse of 21st century life is all these ways that we have of getting in touch with each other. And that is indeed something that also came up in the paper uh, that Caitlin wrote in the study was how many different avenues we have and how that sometimes can create difficulties, which, which we know. We all know that if we listen to the show. If you're a new listener, you might not have experienced that yet uh, or you might not be experiencing that at all because the wonderful thing about this new world of work is that it's broad it's huge. It's diverse. We might use the same tool in very different ways. We make things work in one context, not in another. So I will just leave you with those reflections and to say that wherever you are, whatever you're doing, enjoy.